light shine into our hearts. I pray that you'll anoint this offering. Bless it today for the intended purpose in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter. I'm going to deal with a subject that I've been wanting to deal with for a while. I've been asked this question on several occasions about this, and it's one of those subjects that there really isn't, um, there's not a one paragraph or one sentence answer that really answers uh, this type of a question or this subject. And there's a lot of subjects that people come and they want to know what does the Bible mean when it says this or what does it mean uh, in this scripture. And you can't just say, well, it means such and such because some of those things, they do require a Bible study uh, to get into them. And this is one of those subjects we're going to be talking about um, tonight about um, uh, perfection. And uh, Hebrews chapter 6 the Apostle Paul writing here in verse 1, he said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. I want you to first notice here that there are in verse 2, of course, in verse 1, there are six principles of the doctrine that uh, doctrine of Christ that are listed here. He listed repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So then, after those are um, established, it's as though he's already taught them, he's already instructed them on those then the challenge is, is for us to go on into perfection. Now, I know that some people include perfection as the part of the principles of the doctrine he's talking about here as though it was another subject. But I want to show you that it's not. It's, it's something different. As far as the definition of this word perfection, the reason so many people stumble over this subject is because of the definition. There are actually 16 Greek and Hebrew words that are translated into our English word perfection. There are six Hebrew words and there are ten Greek words. The word perfection here in Hebrews 6 and 1 is from 50, 56 in the Greek and it means complete in various applications of labor, growth, mental, and moral character, meaning completeness or of full age meaning full-age man or full-grown man. It means to be man-perfect, which also means one definition simply says mature. When you have reached the place where you are mature. Now, normally I would take the time to read because of the complexity of this subject, each of these six, uh, 16 different words and their definitions, but, but I've gone through them. And they all have basically the same meaning. They only vary as they apply to certain things or situations. And so it's important to note here that, that the reason I'm not going to get into all the details of that just yet is because the Bible usage of the word perfection here, it's miles apart from, from our English definition. We would normally quote when we talk about perfection, which is the stumbling block for most people, we quote from Webster's. Webster's, uh, when he defines the word perfection, he says it means complete in all respects, without defect or omission. It means to be sound and flawless in a condition of complete excellence as in skill or quality. It means flawless and most excellent. Of course, we've all heard it said nobody is perfect. And we usually say that right after somebody's done something wrong or when we've done something wrong, especially. And no one is perfect. We always declare that except Jesus. And according to Webster's de uh, definition of perfection, that is true. That is true. But the Bible doesn't use Webster's definition when it speaks of perfection. So that's why I want to look 
at this and study from the original Bible language definitions instead of Webster's. If you listen to what Webster said, then just give up because there's no such thing as perfection. But the reality is perfection is a Bible doctrine and it is attainable in God's sight while we live here on this earth. And I want to show that to you. Two things ought to be kept in mind here while studying this word perfection. Number one, God is perfect in every aspect. Um, it doesn't matter if you're using the definition, 16 definitions in Greek and Hebrew, or if you use Webster's definition. God is perfect in every aspect. He is without flaw. He lacks nothing. He is indisputable. He is sinless. He cannot be tempted. He is God. We, we only see in part uh, the, the Apostle Paul said, but we, we know in part, but God knows all things. There is no limit to his knowledge. Second Samuel 22 and 31 said, As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. That word buckler there, it means he's a shield, a protector, or a defense. We certainly don't have the time to talk about all the areas of God's perfection, but we do know that he is perfect. And the second thing is we know that God's word is perfect in every aspect. It needs no additions, no deletions, no corrections. It needs to be studied. It needs to be listened to. It needs to be preached, and it needs to be obeyed. According to Psalms chapter 19, verse 7, James 1, 25, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. The Bible teaches perfection. It encourages perfection. God demanded an outward physical perfection from the Levites and the Old Testament priesthood in Exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6. Today, he requires an inward spiritual perfection of the New Testament priesthood of believers according to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. The Bible also teaches us how to become complete or to be a full-grown man, meaning mature adult in Christ Jesus. The Bible teaches us to abstain or to avoid sinning, and yet we're not doomed if we fail. 1 John 2 and 1 said, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. That's God's will for us, that we sin not. He said, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. That means an intercessor, a consoler, or a comforter. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation, meaning our atonement for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So God knew from the very beginning that we would, that we would and we do fail. He knew that we would all fail. In fact, I don't have time to go into all the scriptures that tell us that we're all sinners. Amen. We all fail. But perfection doesn't indicate that we are flawless and we are sinless individuals that never has or never will fail God. It doesn't mean that. When a true saint of God fails, even when they are constantly striving not to fail, they quickly go to God in repentance. They're mature. They know where to go, even to their fellow man if they've wronged them. They go there because they want to be right with God. That's maturity. That's perfection. I'll get into that a little bit more here in just a moment. But when Christians are willing to do that, they're doing what is righteous. They're doing what is right. And when they strive to obey God's word to be a better saint, to follow peace with all men and holiness, that proves that they are perfect or they are mature in the eyes of God. It doesn't mean you won't make mistakes, but when you're mature, you don't hide from them. When you're mature, you don't try to cover them up. When you're mature in Christ, you go try to make it right. That's what he's talking about. So God's will for our life, when he says he wants us to be perfect it simply means being mature, being full-grown, or being complete in Christ. When you're wrong, you need to accept responsibility for what you've done and then move on. Those that fail to grow up, those that fail to correct the mistakes that they've made, 
those that refuse to walk in obedience to the word of the Lord, they're babes. The Bible called them carnal, and they're unskilled in the word. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12, Paul said, For when for the time when ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. I've told you this story before, but a pastor told me several years ago that there was a new convert in their church that went to a women's conference with a bunch of women in the church. They all rode in the church van together, and somehow in this trip, the subject came up of women cutting their hair. And these women that had been in the church for many years. They were talking about how they have figured out a way to cut their hair without anyone noticing it. When all of a sudden they noticed that this new convert sitting on this church van with them began to cry. And she said they were trying to console her, find out what was wrong. She said, she said, when I first came to this church, she said, that was one of the things I struggled with the most. She said, but when I was praying, she said, God spoke to me and said this. He said, when you cut your hair, you're giving life to the very things that I'm trying to kill in you. Now, Hebrews 5 and 12 said here, for when, for the time, meaning when enough time has passed, that you that are mature, that should be teachers, ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. You're learning now from the mouths of babes and sucklings. You cannot be perfect when you rebel against basics. It doesn't matter how long you've been in the church. You'll never be perfect when you rebel against the basics because it implies that you're still not full grown. It implies you're still not spiritually mature. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and 48, Be ye therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now some people don't even try when you read that. You don't even try. Perfection is what we're going to get when we get over there. Well, why would he say do it if it was unattainable? We're thinking about Webster's definition of the word perfect. But the word perfect here comes from the root word telos in the Greek, and it means the end, the limit, or the goal. Being like Jesus is the goal. That's the goal. That's the target. Luke expressed it the same thought in Luke 6 and 36 when he said, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. Let him be your pattern. Follow his example. That's what he's saying. So perfection is the goal that is set before us. This word commonly means finished or complete. In the same way, I love this, I love this uh, definition. The word perfection here in Matthew 5 and 48, be ye therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. One writer said this perfection, this word is commonly means finished or complete in the same way that a piece of machinery is complete in its parts. So when this applies to Men, it refers to a completeness of parts or to a perfection when no part is defective or lacking. That's how the Bible could say of Job in Job chapter 1 and verse 1 that Job was a perfect man. It didn't say that he was holy like God was holy, nor did it say that he was sinless like God is sinless because we were later told that there was fault found in Job according to Job 9 and 20 and Job 42 and verse 6. But his piety, his, he, he was proportionate. He had a completeness of parts. He was consistent. He was regular everywhere he went. And that was the meaning of Matthew, not Uh, Not to be religious merely in loving your friends or loving your neighbors, but in loving your enemies as well. That's being perfect by following God's example. Matthew 5 and 43, let me read more of this. He said, you have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 
Why? He said that ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son... S-U-N, his son, to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. He's saying you need to follow his example. It's easy to love people that love you, but try loving people that hate you. Strive for that goal. Somebody said, well, I can't do that. Yes, he said you can. You have all the parts you need, like the parts of machinery that's put together. If you have Christ in you, you have everything you need. You have all of the qualities, all the attributes, all the resources, and all the power. So all you need to do is put it into motion. Get up every day saying, I'm going to be like Jesus. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to follow his example. If somebody does me wrong, I'm going to keep on loving them. I'm going to keep on forgiving them. I'm going to treat them like I want to be treated. I know that the Lord loved them so much that he let it rain on the just as well as the unjust. There's a great beautiful uh, a great beautiful harvest coming in my field. Thank God that it's hitting the man next to me that don't know the Lord. That's how he is, and that's how we ought to be. We ought not to be kind. And, and compassionate to those that are in the church and then forsake the world. We need to set the goal to be like Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3 and 1, Paul said, And brethren, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. He's talking to people that have already had an experience for a long time. They shouldn't be carnal. They ought to be spiritual. He said, but I, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto, or for up to this point, you were not able to bear it. Neither are ye able. Neither are ye now able. He was saying you were not ready for it back then, and you're not ready for it now. For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions are not are ye not carnal and walk as men he said you're not following the example of Christ folks we got to get out of this mentality that this is just my nature and i i'm just the kind of person that let lets people know what i think no you've got built inside of you if you've got the holy ghost you've got all the parts of the machinery to make it work you're not a broke down vessel you've got everything you need to make it work you need to get up every day and concentrate on making it work not letting the flesh take control and saying things just because it comes to your mind You've got to love people. You've got to be a peacemaker. You've got to be somebody that wants to be meek around the church as well as the world. Some things we wouldn't have to preach very often if our seasoned saints, those that have been in this for a while, would just live what you know is right. Sometimes people learn more by what they see than by what they hear. Amen. Amen. I think we too often view perfection as an unattainable goal in this life, and so we don't even try. We tend to find comfort as well as an excuse for not even trying in the Scripture that says in Isaiah 64 and 6, our righteousness is as filthy rags in His sight. So we're just going to say, well, I can't even, it doesn't matter how good I do it, I'm never going to reach that mark. We're just going to trust grace to carry us through. No, that's not the plan of God for your life. In the eyes of men, you will never be perfect. In the eyes of men who judge you by Webster's definition of perfection, you will never be perfect. But in the eyes of God, you can be complete, mature, and perfect in Him. If your motives are to fix what you what you make, what mistakes you make, you're perfect. Failures will come, but you can rise above those things when you're grown up, when you're mature, when you're of full age in Christ. There are some people that have been in the church for many years. They always struggle with standards. They always rebel against the basics. That's a clear sign. Your, your, Your years of seniority doesn't determine where you are spiritually. It's a clear sign of their weakness and their spiritual immaturity. So for those that want to get close to God, if you see somebody like that, Do you see that they're always complaining and they can't even get over the basic things? Don't follow people like that. The Bible teaches us, even in the scriptures we just read in Hebrews 6 and 1, that there is something to go on to. 
Well, I've learned all the basics. I know the foundation. I've repented. I've been baptized. I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm trying to live and walk before Him like He wants me to. I'm looking up ready for the rapture. Now, there's something else to go on to. And it's to try every day to be like Jesus. Paul tells the Colossians that they were complete or perfect in Him, meaning in Christ in chapter Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10. Again, if you have Christ... You have all the parts. You have everything you need. That's what he's saying. So that means that scripturally, we are perfectible. The Bible tells us we are perfectible. I want to look at a few scriptures with that in view. We are to mark Psalms chapter 37, verse 37, chapter 64, verses 1 and 4, tells us we are to mark the perfect man. That means to watch him, to take note of him. To learn from him. One writer said we need to mark him in the beginning, mark him in the midst of the journey, and then mark him at the end. Why? Because the end of that man, the Bible said, would be peace. Matthew 5 and 48 tells us that we are to be perfect in love as the Father in heaven is perfect in love. How do we do that? By loving our enemies just like he did. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 through 13, the fivefold ministry is given for the perfecting of the saints. God's word is given to us to perfect, uh, to, to perfect and thoroughly furnish us. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17, controlling our tongue. This is, a, this is a tough one. It's also a part of perfection. James chapter 3 and verse 2 says, For in many things we offend all. Think about that. For in many things we offend all. Or we all make mistakes. We all fall short. Amen. Well, if you get the Holy Ghost, you don't make mistakes. No. He said we all. He included himself. For in many things we offend all. If any man defend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. This word perfect here, it means he's reached maturity. One translation said he, the same is a perfect man, meaning he has reached maturity of character. Somebody said if you can control the whole body just by controlling the tongue, then the tongue must be the hardest one to control, and it is. Because everything that's said or done, you've got an opinion. Somebody tells me, well, I don't really have an opinion on that. Yes, you do. We all have an opinion. We have an opinion on everything. We offend in so many things. Unintentionally, we can offend in so many things. But he said, but if a man offend not in word, how is it possible to not offend in a word? You ever think about that? Someone said, well, I didn't even mean to offend them and I offended them. How can I not offend in word? It's inevitable I'm going to offend people. Jesus was perfect and he offended people in word. They didn't like the truth and it offended them. When he preached to them, you got to eat my body and drink my blood. The Bible said many were offended and would not follow anymore. Said, who can, who can hear such a saying? But here's the point. If a man can offend not in word, if a man can be honest, if a man can tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, Sometimes, sometimes the truth needs to be kept to yourself. Amen. If it's a truth about somebody else, it might not be any of your business. You can offend people in truth and it not be righteous. If you're preaching the truth to them and they don't want to listen to the plan of God and they're offended by that, that's different. But when you, when you learn, some of us need to learn how to be quiet. If you can just be quiet, don't say anything. It's better than saying something that's going to offend. It's better to offend in silence than to offend in a word. He said if a man can, can, can offend not in a word, the same as a perfect man. The same man has reached maturity of character and he's going to be able to, one translation said, he will appear to be able to bridle the whole body. 
When people see somebody that can hold their tongue, they think that guy's got, he's got control of everything else. He's in charge in his life. The Holy Ghost is in charge in him because he's not reckless about what he says. He thinks about what he's going to say and how it's going to affect the person that's going to hear it. Striving for perfection should be a constant thing. Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. According to Webster's definition, we'll never be able to achieve perfection in the eyes of men. But if we stop worrying about what Webster said, we can go on to maturity and perfection in Christ. I want to also stress here that biblical perfection is also required. There are several areas of our lives that need perfecting. And they're pointed out to us in the scripture. Development, maturity, they're desperately needed in several areas of our life. And I, I don't have time to cover all these. I've got way too many scriptures that I can't go over them. But we, I want to cover just a couple of these very quickly here. Number one is faith and works. I want to talk about these two separately. It was God that joined these two elements together. So one without the other is incomplete doesn't do you any good to have works if you have no faith. And it doesn't good to, it do you any good to have faith if you have no works. And I want to talk about these separately. I want to show the importance of them. But ultimately, they both have to be present and joined in unison for anything worthwhile to be accomplished. It's, it's not one that's greater than the other. Both are important. Both are essential elements in our life. Now, faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, Paul gives us the definition of faith. He said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Another translation said, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction, meaning the confidence, the certainty, and the assurance of things not seen. But then after we're saved... We are to go on and develop our faith in God to a point of perfection or to a point of maturity. Paul wanted to help the Thessalonian uh, church to perfect what was lacking in their faith. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. The Bible then gives a good example of the desperate cry of a man fighting his unbelief in Mark chapter 9 verses 14 through 29 and verses 23 and 24. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. I, I believe you can do it, but help thou my unbelief. James told us that we are to ask God in faith with nothing wavering. James chapter 1 verses 5 and 6. We're told to hold fast the profession our faith without wavering in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 23. James also told us that Abraham's faith was perfected by works and faith without works is dead. James chapter 2 verses 14 through 26. God wanted our faith in him to be mature to the point that we trust him regardless of what he does, regardless of whether the answer is okay or not now or never. We still, we're going to trust God and obey him whether it's the right answer that we wanted or not. And we, 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 hear, we pray a lot of prayers and believe God for things. And a lot of things we think he did not answer. He did not tell us what we wanted to know or what we wanted to hear. But that doesn't mean he didn't answer. And that doesn't mean that he may not answer. The truth is God knows what he's doing. And when you're mature in your faith, you say like Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm full grown. I've been in this long enough to know I'm not going to complain and murmur when the answer is not what I want it to be. I'm going to trust that God knows best. He knows what I need today, but he also knows what I need tomorrow. He knows the consequences of giving me what I want. And thank God for the unanswered prayers. Thank God for the times he said no. Thank God for the times he said not now. This is not right for you. And I want to be mature enough to say he gives and he still takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. The second thing, the partner of faith is works. God expects us to put hands and feet to our prayers and our faith. Someone said one time, works is the spirit or the life of faith. I like that. Works is the spirit or the life of faith. James 2 and 26 tells us without works 
our faith being alone, if it doesn't have the partner, it's dead. It's dead. Faith without the partner of works is dead. Again, Abraham's faith was said to be perfected by his works, James 2 and 22. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 through 21 tells us that God wants us, God wants to make us perfect in every good work to do his will. The rich young ruler that Jesus spoke to, he did many good things, but he was still imperfect in what God wanted him to do. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. God told the church at Sardis that their works were not perfect before him, Revelation 3 and 2. We know that there is a direct correlation between faith and works according to Romans chapter 4, Galatians chapter 3, and James chapter 2. But what about a perfect heart? What about a perfect heart? Several Old Testament, New Testament characters are good examples of what God's expectations were as far as our heart is concerned. Solomon exhorted Israel to let their heart be perfect before God. 1 Kings 8 and 61, he said, Let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord, with the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. Just be obedient. That's an element of perfection. Of course, we know that first, according to 1 Kings chapter 11, strange women turned Solomon's heart away from God because the Bible said in verse 4 that his heart was not perfect with the Lord. David warned Solomon to serve the Lord with a perfect heart. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. Abijam, who was the king of Judah, he didn't have a perfect heart before God either, according to 1 Kings chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and reminded God that he had a perfect heart before the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 7, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 24 through 31. Amaziah, who was the king of Judah, the Bible said he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, 2 Chronicles chapter 25 verses 1 through 2, but not with a perfect heart. One translation said he did it, but he resented it. Our motives are important about even what, whatever you're doing for the kingdom of God. Your motives are just as important to God as your actions are. God will show himself strong to those whose hearts are perfect According to 2 Chronicles 16 and verse 9. Psalms chapter 101 and verse 1 through 3. God cares about your motives you can give to the poor, but if you gave to be seen, then it doesn't matter. You might as well not have given. But if you give with the right motive, it's perfect before the Lord. We are to love God, the Bible said, with all of our hearts. Luke chapter 10, verse 27. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Jesus spoke about those things that come from the heart. Listen to this. He wanted us to guard the heart from those things. Mark chapter 7 verse 20. And he said, That which cometh out of the man is that that defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. We have to guard our hearts. The things that come out, some of it's the, the Adam nature born into us, but a lot of it is what we allow to come in and take root. It's not just what you do with your body. It's not what you do just on the outside. It's what your thoughts and intents are. God knows those just as well. We have to guard our hearts. The Bible tells us that the early church served God with one heart or singleness of heart. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 through 47. Acts chapter 4 verse 31 through 37. Ananias and Sapphira were both struck dead because the Bible said their hearts were not right with God. Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 11. So the fact is that inward maturity and undivided hearts are absolutely essential in our lives if we want to be protected or we want to be perfect in, front of, uh, in the face of the Lord. Matthew chapter 6 verse 22 through 23. Reuben was 
was also condemned for having a divided heart in Judges chapter 5 and verse, uh, verse 15. So if he was condemned for that, how could we expect anything less? The Bible tells us that where our treasures are, there will our heart be also. Some people struggle over so much in the church because this is not where their heart is. Amen. People that struggle with their attendance at church, their heart is not here. If your heart was here, you'd be here. Amen. It should be the prayer of every saint of God to help us keep our heart with all diligence, purity, guard it, ask God to search it, perfect it, let it be perfect in His sight. Lastly, I want to talk about love. Perfection in love is when we can love our enemies. Jesus commanded that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. He's quoting also from the Old Testament, from the Ten Commandments. We need to love our brethren with what the Bible called an unfeigned, meaning a genuine love. You ever hear people say, well, I, I don't like them, but I love them. <laughs> I don't know how you reason with that. There's folks I don't like. I'm not going to lie to you. He's still working on me. Some folks I don't like. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know where along my walk with God that that kind of pure, genuine love that Jesus had for them would be in me. The only thing I can figure is when we see that they are sinners on a path to self-destruction like we were, we need to love them enough to pray them off of that path. Amen. There are a soul. I may not like them, but God loves them. And he wants me to love them like he loves them. Jesus commanded us to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. And I don't believe he would command us something that could not be accomplished in us. Keeping God's word demonstrates perfect love. 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. Loving one another shows perfection in love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 11 through 21. And charity is called the bond of perfectness in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14. I'm closing with this, but I, I, I'm committed. I am absolutely certain that hatred, strife, bitterness, they have no place in the heart and life of a child of God. Those are feelings we should never harbor. Prejudice, bigotry, racism, hatred, they have to leave when the love of God comes inside. And the love of God cannot be perfect in your life until you get rid of those other things. We need God to help to mature us to the point that we love more than just our own family, more than just our four and no more, more than just our own close friends. But we can see a hurting, hungry, a lonely world, a world that doesn't know the Lord and love them as he loved them. How do we love them that much, Brother Moses? By sharing the gospel with them. Give them a chance to get off of that path to destruction. Stand with me tonight. Perfection is achievable. Perfection is attainable. Our God would never have called us to go on to perfection in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Someone wrote this quote, and I love this. It said, conversion is the miracle of a moment, but the making of a saint is the work of a lifetime. Conversion is the miracle of a moment, but the making of a saint is is the work of a lifetime. You can repent of your sins, come to an altar. You can, you can be baptized in his name, be filled with his spirit, and that's a conversion. But he's not done with you yet. He wants to work on you for a lifetime. Our goal should be to go from babes to mature adults because milk belongs to babes while meat belongs to them that are of a mature or full age according to Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. We can be perfect. Our motives have to be. When you make a mistake, 
Your motive is to be to fix it, not to cover it up. Mature people want to make what's wrong right, and God sees that as perfection. We're not going to be perfect like Webster defines it, but we can be perfect like God defines it. I want my motives to be right. Amen. I want him to be on my side. When I fail, when I fall short, he doesn't cast me out. I've got an advocate with the Father. I've got, I've got a source of atonement when I need it. I can come back and repent again, and he's going to be there to forgive and let me keep on going. I'm glad I know him today. Amen. God bless you. Appreciate you being here. Don't forget rally Friday night.